Hello everyone. It's great to be here. Can you can you all hear me? Okay, cool. So it's great to be here at Utah JS uh, for the first time, and I'm so happy that I'm not the one session between you and lunch. <laughs> and yeah, so we gotta discuss hydration, islands, streaming, resumability, and a bunch of other stuff. Wow. <laughs> By the way, if you see this emoji at the bottom of any slides, this means, okay, this is a really complex topic. Let's definitely have more discussions afterwards. So again, that's what we want to cover. A little bit of the past and the future, islands architecture, resumability as an alternative to hydration, streaming server-side rendering, and selective hydration. Of course, React Server components, because you cannot do a whole session about rendering patterns and not mention that. And then we'll draft some closing thoughts. And I guess it all starts with the question of how and where we want to render some content. Because these days, for example, we can render things on a web server, on a build server, at, at the browsers, and even at the edge server. And also, we might have different strategies for doing so. So we might render everything all at once, or we could go with some approach like partially or progressively doing things. Not to mention a lot of other questions that arise, like where exactly do we do navigation? Is that on the server or on the client? And what is exactly executed when your app loads? And where do you do data fetching? Or even what exactly goes into your application bundle, or what is exactly serialized and sent over the wire? So that's a bunch of other questions. And I don't know about you, but I feel like, how did we get here in the first place? So I'm gonna do a little bit of a trip back in time here for a while, and let's talk about the past, more specifically about 1995, which was a year that a lot of interesting things happened and a lot of important milestones in the whole world I'm talking, of course, about PHP 1.0, and this was... <laughs> but seriously, though, uh, CGI scripting languages like PHP and Perl, they were just great because they allowed us to render our backend data sources to HTML. So for the first time, we could grab some real-time data or database, et cetera, and serve that to an end user, and that was great. And the reason why all of these were working on the server is because back then, the server was the powerful part of the network. So basically, all the browser has to, had to do was to interpret some information and show that. So that was about showing information, not interacting with it a lot. And then JavaScript as a language evolved a lot, and browsers as a platform did as well. And we could suddenly do a lot of fun things directly on the browser, and that was the rise of client-side rendering and SPAs as we know them. And SPAs were great because we didn't have to go back to the server anymore, for example, for navigation. And also, once everything was in place, we could just cache our main HTML and JavaScript models, and that was like, boom, super fast. And again, as things became more and more interactive, SPAs and client-side rendering became our default way of building things. But then, suddenly we had to be concerned about things like other performance aspects, like, okay, how is this bundle going to be downloaded for a user that is, has a mobile phone on a, the, on a bus in the middle of the city center, for example? So we were like, okay, let's just go back to the server. But this time, we were doing something called server-side rendering, which, as Reiki, uh, his part of React Team points, it wasn't like we did with PHP or Ruby. We we're just rendering the first client render. So that's why he suggested it should be called server-side client rendering. That was also great because basically the HTML was just ready to be displayed when the page was loaded, so nice performance. You also had some compatibility gains because a lot of the things were less dependent on which browser features our users had. But again, for interactive websites, we still needed to ship JavaScript, and then we start talking about hydration. And I'm gonna do a little bit of an intermission on the topic of hydration right now. So if you're not familiar, I, I love this definition by Mishko from Angle and Quick. So he says that hydration is this process of attaching behavior to declarative content to make it interactive. 
And hydration comes with a few challenges. The first and most obvious one is you have to associate the Don, uh, the Don elements with their event handlers. Not only that, but on, once a user they trigger it, some update, you have to update your app state to reflect the change. And once your app state is updated, you need to revisit your whole component hierarchy to represent a new state. Hydration also comes with a few questions. So for example, if you're implementing things, do you want to send all the JavaScript on every request, or you come up with some strategy like serving that per route? Also, do you do hydration top-down? And if you do so, how expensive is that? And then also, how are you going to make that the developer experience out of that? How are the developers going to organize their code? Hydration also comes with a few issues. This is probably the most famous one that is called the uncanny valley. So it happens after you have your initial request and then you get the HTML and the view is painted. But then you have to wait for JavaScript to get to the browser and also to be executed, parsed, and et cetera. So users, they see the server-side rendered app, but they just cannot interact with it. And if we break down each of those steps, the first part of getting HTML, that's usually fast. But then you'd need to download JavaScript, and that can be slow depending on the network conditions of your users. And then you have to parse and execute JavaScript. Again, this can be slow depending on the amount of JavaScript you're shipping to your users, and also depending on the device capabilities they have. I'm talking like low-end devices. And then you have to recover state and bind those event listeners. And this can be slow depending on how many done elements you have to go through and also how many references you need to bind to those listeners. And there's a bunch of posts out there that you can check for the issues of hydration, and et cetera. But these, um, after that, people start coming up with ways to kind of improve how hydration happened. And then in 2020, uh, we started listening a lot about islands and islands architecture. And it's funny because there's this post uh, from 2013. It's called Declarative view JS Components with ViewLoader.js. And it's crazy because this post kind of describes what islands are a few years before we were talking about islands. Anyways, it was in 2020 that Jason Miller, uh, the creator of Preact, he, he kind of pop made the term popular with this post called Islands Architecture. And that was the definition, a component-based architecture that suggests a compartmentized view of the page with static and dynamic islands. So that was pretty much about selectively and progressively enhancing parts of server-rendered HTML with client-side JavaScript. And you had small focus chunks of interactivity within server-rendered pages. And that was a little bit of a mind shift. We were going from a scenario where we had a single application in control of the full rendering to a point where we had kind of, more of multiple entry points. Uh, one great thing is that the script for each island, it can be delivered and hydrated independently, and the rest of the page, it can be just static HTML, and that's exactly what an, out an output of an island is, progressively enhanced HTML. But with islands, you have a little bit of more specificity around how this enhancement is going to occur. It's better if you can visualize that. So here's a simple blog page where we have a layout, and then we have the title of the blog, the content itself, and at the bottom we have some comments and some social buttons for social sharing. If we were to model that with islands, um, our layout, our title, and the content, because they are static, they can be server-side rendered and shipped just HTML. And then the parts where you need interaction, that are the placeholder, and like the comments and the social buttons, they will have placeholders that are server-side rendered, and inside them, you're gonna have the hydration scripts for both of them. Nowadays, you have many options for doing islands. You have standalone meta frameworks like Astro, Quake, Marco, and others. And you also have options for doing islands with Preact, Solid, and Svelte. And Marco is amazing because Marco has been there for years now, since 2014. And Marco shipped a very interesting combo of streaming rendering with automatic partial hydration and a very smart compiler that would basically 
generate optimized code depending on whether it was going to run in the server or the client. And with Marco, also the components, they could hydrate themselves. And of course, the, the hydration code is only shipped for these interactive components. A few years later, in 2021, we got Astro. And Astro was built from scratch around the idea of islands. And with the premise of by default shipping just zero JavaScript. And you had each Astro island hydrated and part loaded in parallel. Another great thing about Astro is that basically you can build islands with React, Svelte, Vue, and many others. And another thing that is just great DX is that you can specify the loading strategy for each island individually. So here's a code snippet where I'm using a React island in Astro. And you can see that I can specify with their directives, for example, whether I want this code to be hydrated upon loading, or when the browser is idle, or many other things. Anyways, um, what's great about, hydra about islands is because you're overall reducing the amount of JavaScript code that is shipped to the clients, and that's great, because you get faster metrics like page load and TTI. Also, because of that, the important content tends to be shipped really fast to your users. And another thing is, you still have some SSR benefits like uh, SEO. What's not great though, is that depending on your use case, if you just have a lot of interaction, you might end up with a lot of islands and then you might be missing the whole point. Then in 2021, we got also got another approach, this time resumability. And I think that a good way to see resumability is to think about how this whole SSR thing. So if we think that a, a huge part of our isomorphic JavaScript landscape was built on top of frameworks that were not built to be server-side rendered. So if we go back to experiments we had in 2013, for example, um, Airbnb had one of the most popular ones. Everyone, they were grabbing things like Angular, React, Backbone, and trying to server-side render that with Node. But what if we had a framework that was built from scratch with the idea of server-side rendering in the first place? Actually, this project called Opa Language, they were doing that back in 2011. And that was great because it was way beyond partial hydration. You could write your code and they would basically slide, slice client and server concerns for you back in 2011. And then, Years later, we got Meteor that, in a sense, had some of that. And then, in 2021, we got Quick. And Quick shipped with the idea of resumability that is basically about pausing execution on the server and resuming on the client without having to replay and download the whole application logic. So that's pretty much it. Do some work, pause, and then resume where you left off. And you are using what happened during the execution on the server to avoid extra work on the client. So if we compare it to the traditional hydration, um, we can notice a few differences. The first one is, and I'm not, not talking about progressive or selective or anything, traditional hydration. First, it is eager because the event handler creation, it happens before those events are triggered. And also, all of the handlers, they are created. So it's kind of speculative because those, those event handlers, they might not be used in the end. Also, you have client redoing a lot of work that was done in the server previously. With resumability, you have the complete opposite. So first, it is lazy because the event handler creation, it happens only when the event is triggered. And only the triggered events are basically created and registered. So this leverages a lot of deserialization and it's easier if we see that. So imagine a quick app where you initially display some HTML, and then you resume state from the server, and that includes the event handlers, also the application state, and the component hierarchy. So that's a lot of things to be serialized. And then you get your page to be interactive. If we shift this comparison from traditional hydration to other approaches like islands, some of the differences are not there anymore, but still, with islands, you you, the client is still redoing work, and also islands, they happen at what's 
island level with resumability, you don't have work being redone and you have a way more granular level that is subcomponent level. If you're more interested in the topic, there's this amazing live stream by Ryan Corniato from Solid and Mishko Havery, where they basically go and ideate the whole idea. What I consider great about resumability is that first, you get better startup performance because you're avoiding extra work. And because of their fine-grained model, you also get better re uh, rendering performance because only the components that need to be re-rendered are re-rendered. And you get progressive interactivity and all of that. What I don't consider great is that you have to preload your critical interactions. That's, by the way, an official recommendation. So you might end up preloading a lot of code depending on the amount of critical interactions you have in your app. The other thing is this kind of locking you have with resumability and quick because quick is the only option as far as I know to this day where you can use resumability per se. And because of that, all of the discussions, the use cases and et cetera, they're coming from the quick community or builder.io itself. Still, I think that quick is a perfect example of outside of the box thinking that sometimes is needed for the web. And now we're gonna go at the same time backwards and forward to 2022 and 2017. So how many develop React developers we have here, by the way? Wow, quite a few. So you probably remember when React 16 was out, uh, we were all talking about either hooks or suspense or even the new context API, et cetera. But there was this one thing that was streaming server-side rendering that only very few people were talking about. And we only started discussing more in 2022 after this whole suspense SSR plus selective hydration plus concurrent React umbrella. And it's great to basically revisit how hydration happened in React before React 18, which were some of the bad parts. So basically hydration could only begin after the entire page, if the entire data was fetched and rendered in the server. So your users, they basically cannot interact with the page until everything was done for the whole page. And because of that, some of your fast components, they would have to wait for the slow ones. So it basically looks like that. So we have all of these steps that are sequential and blocking. So you fetch data, you render HTML, and that's when you get your first byte. And then you load code on the client and you get your first contentful paint. And only after hydration is that it, you get like time to interactive. With this whole umbrella, we can shift this into this. And what's happening here is we're leveraging first this new API, pipe to node stream, with create hood and suspense itself. And basically by doing so, React is going to prioritize hydrating the components that the user inter interacted with before the rest of the page. And that's how components can become interactive faster also because the browser can do other work at the same time as hydration because of the concurrent React themes. And the result here is that React no longer has to wait for huge components to load to continue streaming HTML for the rest of the page. And when it's done in the server, it's going to be streamed and inserted as a script tag in the right place. A lot of companies, they did use cases of that. Vercel, for example, they improved INP and other core web vitals by leveraging selective hydration and streaming SSR, and they have this case documented there. Another thing that we started to hear a lot about in 2020 was this whole thing of React server components, which is crazy because there were some PRs around what's called the experimental React flight infrastructure from back 2017, 18, 19. So it was coming. And then in late 2020, these all got announced as introducing zero bundle size React server components. And basically we had this storm of a lot of information and et cetera. And the React team and the community, they were all like confused on how to, okay, how to suspense server components, transitions and all of that, how do they all piece together and et cetera. One way I think it's really interesting to see server components is as you had ahead of time comp rendering that can happen during build time, but also on the server. And server components are a lot about a new routing paradigm that is also integrated with how you do data fetching and also with what you bundle in your app. And as odd as it might seem, it is not necessarily related to SSR or even hydration itself. 
Now that we discussed islands, you can kind of abstract the idea of server components using islands because a few things are almost identical to how islands work. But the difference is with islands and Astro, for example, we had React and then you had Astro doing the thing. Here, the Astro-like part is also React. So that's why, for example, in Next 13 with the app router, you have that thing, use client, because it's basically marking the boundary between two different module graphs. Another great thing is that with server components, each component can decide whether it wants to be a server component or a server plus client component. And these are, in my opinion, the most amazing things about server components. The first is that the code for the server components never delivered to the client, which is an advantage over a lot of things we have these days because in many implementations of SSR, you still have component code getting sent over the wire in JS bundles, which can delay interactivity. The second thing is you have access to the backend from anywhere within the tree. And that's amazing because we're used to have tools like Next where you ha we have access to the backend just at the page top level that is our page. So we get server side props and other lifecycle methods that allows us to do that. So with server components, this can happen anywhere in the tree. And what I love the most is this last bullet here. They may be refreshed while maintaining client side state inside of the tree. So that's amazing because Im imagine, for example, a search bar where you're typing and fetching info, but some state like the selection or what's in the input, all of that, it's capped. That's, that's, that's amazing. Anyways, what I don't consider quite great about server components is that I'm first concerned that we may end up in some apps sending a lot of data over the wire on every server, React server read render. Um, another thing is, if you're building an app with that, maybe they will come up with something else, but as of now, I think there's still a lot of orchestration needed for both people building apps and people building libraries and et cetera. And the whole thing is, is still a lot experimental in my opinion. And you have very few options to use server components nowadays if you want so. Um, anyways, this whole topic of server components, it, they rem it reminds me a lot of this tweet by Mishko where he said that code extraction and how you collocate client and server code is, are gonna be the next big thing in our community. And it reminds me a lot of this thing called Jaxer. So Jaxer was there back in 2008 and Basically, it allowed you to have those single file apps with logic that could run on both client and server. And let me highlight this part. So you had script, and you had this run at attribute, and you could specify, for example, server or both. And if you put side by side the examples you would have with Jaxer back in 2008 and the state of the art examples of server components, you notice a lot of similar stuff. Of course, they're not the same thing. Anyways, I feel like a lot of us, myself included, still need to learn a lot about server components. About a month ago, there was this talk by Tejas in React Rally here. So if you're interested, he was basically building a demo of how you can implement server components. There are also a lot of great streams and YouTube videos. And you can also follow some projects on GitHub, like Waku by Daishi Kato, he is building a parallel alternative of React server components. Not to mention things like Blink by Tenor. So uh, with Blink, it, they're not server components per se, but in this project, Tenor explores a lot of code extraction and collocation, et cetera. Ooh. So a little bit about the future. First, I think that we'll be revisiting a lot this whole idea of navigation and where you do navigation and routing and MPAs versus SPAs and et cetera. And by the way, there's this amazing live stream by Ryan where it's basically four hours of uh, talking about all of the nuances of MPAs and SPAs and everything in between. We'll be discussing a lot about hydration and new approaches to hydration, uh, progressive, selective, whatever, resumability, that is a whole different thing, islands. 
we'll be discussing a lot of whether we really want to have zero kilobyte JavaScript apps or not. And of course, code, in, code extraction and how to collocate client and server code and et cetera. And last but not least, we'll, be, we'll continue to talk about why some given technology is the future of the web. Um, a few closing thoughts be before we go. As you probably notice, the solution to a given problem usually just changes the problem that you have. And I think that a very good thing is that we tend to see islands, resumability, server components, and et cetera as competitors, but actually they don't completely solve the same issue. They just happen to focus on different parts of the same problem. And that's why the same pattern can be good and bad depending on your case. And you will notice, especially in huge apps, that different routes or different parts of the app, they will use completely different patterns. That's why I really like this thing uh, called application holotypes by Jason Miller. Basically, in this post, he explores uh, a lot of different kinds of apps you might want to build, like a social network or an e-commerce or a game. And he basically discusses each topic. Okay, how do you handle uh, something specific to this type of app? I think that's essential. That's why I like, um, basically, Ryan, on top of that, did an even more in-depth exploration of holotypes, where for each holotypes, you would discuss, for example, how you want to handle routing, how you want to handle hydration, how you want to handle uh, interactivity and persistence, and so on for these different holotypes. Another thing is you probably, if you're on Twitter or anywhere else, actually, you've probably seen a lot of memes and things mocking server components and these other technologies saying that we're just going back to, to rendering HTML on the server. It, and I agree, it's easy to think that we're doing so, but I think that these days the boundaries, they're very, very different. So if we recap with PHP and Rails, the boundary pretty much stopped at the server. It would render the pages and handle submissions. And that was pretty much it. And then Marco, years later in 2014, I mean, they were open sourced after, but in 2014, they were, they tried to push this to envelope the client, but we were really busy building SPAs to notice that. And then in the recent years, we can notice with things like Phoenix, LiveVille, or Laravel, LiveWire, or Hales, Hotwire, all of these technologies, they're doing kind of the same thing, but they're focused on the server technology, be it Rails or Phoenix or PHP. I think that Quick and React server components, they're like an interesting effort to do the same, but coming from a client, from a primarily client technology. And seeing both browser and server as part of the same app while still maintaining their nuances and separating their concerns. I think it's just incredible how software development continues to go through cycles and I think it's really important for us to think what is different now and what was great back then and just turned into lost art. So it's important for us to remember that we are not the one, the first ones trying all of these cool technologies. And a good example is this tweet by Andrew Clark back in 2018. He was pointing how React and the whole fiber reconciliation algorithms brings a lot of inspiration from this technique called double buffering which is something that has been in the game industry for decades now. Another good example from 2021 is Dan Abramov pointing to this post by the Marco team, and this post was published back in 2014, and then was basically saying how the, all of the cool things that React and other frameworks started to explore in 2018, 19, and 2020, Marco was exploring that at least five years before. In this post that he links, it links to another post. And guess what? This other post was published back in 2005. So that's, that's really amazing. And yeah, I agree that a lot of things, they do sound really complex. But I think that they kind of have to 
if we think we're solving, we're kind of trying to solve the uncertainties that we have of serving apps to users with different uh, connections and different device capabilities. And back in 20, 2010, it was a similar thing we had with responsive design. So we basically had an unpredictable amount of screen rations, resolutions, sizes, and et cetera, because of the rise of the mobile web. So all of that is complex, but those are really complex problems we're solving. You know what they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And one of the last things I'd like to share with you today is this picture here. So this, this was me about nine years ago. I went to this iOS meetup and I was presenting and I was really hyped about Ionic. So I basically told them, you know what, this native development thing, this is not gonna be the hot thing in a couple of years. You should just move to Ionic and Angular. That was supposed to be the fun part of the session. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, don't always trust all of these future predictions and speculations and et cetera. Don't, and the whole cliche of silver bullet, don't trust silver bullets. It's important that you identify what are the core metrics for your apps and things that are user-centered, like bounce rates, conversion rates, and et cetera. Because in the end, these are like, these are coming from your real users and these are what gonna matter the most, not some fancy lighthouse scores for you to share. Um, this is me, I am Matos Albuquerque. You can find me everywhere as White Combinator. I am a senior software engineer at Medallia. I am a mentor at Tech Labs Berlin and uh, a Perf, uh, Google Ad developer expert in Perf. Um, here you can find the slides for this session and other sessions I have about performance, internals of React and other stuff. That's pretty much all I had for today. If you have questions, thoughts, or anything, I'm gonna be around. So thank you so much for having me. Good job. Thank you.